Hi, I'm really glad you've joined us today for Worship Life Live. It's always our privilege to come and share this time with you. And uh, we always like to start with a verse of scripture just to get our minds focused and get some thoughts going through our heads before we listen to all this music and, and listen to the interviews with our special guests. I heard something on the radio the other day by the great preacher, uh, Adrian Rogers. I, I tell you, uh, I can't think of very many preachers that have, that have impacted me uh, as much as Dr. Rogers. All those years uh, pastoring at Bellevue Baptist in Memphis and uh, growing up in North Mississippi, uh, I've heard him preach many, many times. The other day I heard him preach from Matthew chapter 7 and it shared some things in that message that really challenged me that I want to remind us all of today. And it's about this idea of prayer. Now it's hard for us to understand why a sovereign God who's in charge of everything would wire the universe to work on prayer. He could have done it all without us. He, didn't, he doesn't need us to ask or petition Him. He could execute His will with or without us. And yet He invites us to come alongside and be part of His activity in the world through prayer. He wants us to have an intimate relationship, a dialogue, a conversation with Him that's dynamic and constant. James tells us that without prayer, nothing works really. And we're reminded that we have not because we ask not. Well, in this teaching from Matthew chapter 7, listen to what Jesus said. He said, keep asking and it will be given to you. Keep searching and you will find. Keep knocking and the door will be open to you. For everyone who asks receives and the one who searches finds and to the one who knocks the door will be open. As you think about this verse of scripture that really talks about prayer, it talks about three kinds of praying, asking, seeking, and knocking. Now if you think about the way we pray, I wonder how often we take advantage of these three distinct ways that we are invited by God to approach Him in prayer. The first one is asking. And we ask and when you think about it, when you ask for something, you're asking for something that you want, asking for something that you desire. And that's what we do when we talk to the Lord. When we ask in prayer, we come before Him. We know what we want. We know what our desire is. And we come to the Lord and we ask Him, Lord, would you do this? Would you give me this? Would you allow this to happen? We ask. Certainly that's an important way to pray. But He doesn't stop there. He says that we seek now we seek not for what we desire because we ask for what we desire. We seek for what we don't understand. You see, you seek, the Bible tells us, and you'll find. Jesus said that over and over. Seek me with all of your heart and you will find me, he says. And here in prayer, he says, seek and you will find. So we ask for what we know we want. We seek for what we don't understand. Maybe you've got a question. Maybe you've got a a situation, then you don't know whether to go left or, or right, up or down. You don't know what the answer is. You're seeking. You're, you need wisdom. And we come before Him when we make that petition known. You know, we know the Bible tells us uh, that if we lack wisdom, and again in James, that if we'll ask and if we'll seek, He'll give it to us. And we seek for when we don't understand. But then there was a third one that was mentioned, and that is the one, knock. I don't know about you, but if someone's knocking at the door, it doesn't take very long to get up and answer the door. We don't ignore it because it's kind of obnoxious. As a matter of fact, Jesus would tell a parable in another passage about the neighbor who comes and knocks until the homeowner answers the door. So we ask for what we want. We seek for what we don't understand. We knock when the door is closed. Do you have a closed door in front of you right now? Something you wanted to do, some place you wanted to go, something that was an aspiration for you, and yet when you pursued it, when you went in that direction, you hit a door. It was closed. What do you do with a closed door? You knock. And the implication here in this passage is you knock and you knock and you knock. You keep knocking. You don't just knock once. You knock and keep on knocking. As a matter of fact, in all of these three ways to pray. We ask, we keep on asking. We seek, we keep on seeking. We knock, and we keep on knocking. And in those three ways, we access the very power of the universe and beyond. The sovereign God who has wired the world to work 
in this dynamic of prayer and the prayers of his people. So I wonder today, what do you want? Ask him for it. What do you need to know? Seek him for the answer. What door are you facing right now that's closed in front of you? Knock on it and keep knocking. And the God who loves you more than you can imagine will answer in the perfect time and in the perfect way. Well, let's look at some great music together. We're really excited to have some wonderful things. We've got some great guests that I'll introduce in just a moment to you. This first anthem that's going to get us started is a song that was arranged by Ken Barker, who is one of our top editors here at Lifeway Worship, orchestrated by our friend Rick Domenico. It's the song titled Mighty Redeemer. Jonathan Allen, Rick Kua, Mia Fields wrote it. Let's listen to this anthem right now. I'm excited to 
share this next interview with you. My friend Greg Nelson, the producer, the songwriter, the great Christian musician and leader for so long, came by Lifeway. What a great friend and partner he's been for many years. I'm excited to show you this interview. We had a great visit together. Let's watch it right now. Greg, it's great to see you, man. Good to uh, see you so too. So glad man. you could be here. And, Me too. and to have you here at Lifeway today, I, it just takes my mind back to those three years that you and I spent together right. uh, developing Lifeway Worship, the worship project, yeah. lifewayworship.com. Oh, good um, years. Here, here's something to just, I, I don't know that you, if you've thought about this lately, but um, we believe every weekend, um, somewhere between seven and 10,000 churches are using wow. either the hymnal or the charts, uh, something like two million people that are singing uh, from the hymnal resources and wow. lifewayworship.com. And Greg, um, just uh, just to say it again, uh, we could have never done it without you. Well, it took a uh, whole bunch of people, didn't it? It did, but you were the creative director that gave oversight to all of the recording project and, and really, ideating around what kinds of resources, what, uh, how, how things would look on the page, the connective tissue of the hymnal itself with the scripture references and the readings and right, right. the segues. I mean, we, we, the list could, goes on and well, on. Well, you know, it's amazing anything happened with someone with ADHD that <laughs> happened. And that's why we need, needed a great leader like you to put well, the whole thing together and I really appreciate it. Well listen, uh, we could not have done it without your expertise well, and your love for the church that was just motivating it all. Many meetings, many tears of joy and, yeah. and excitement and uh, to know uh, now, hard to believe but that was seven or eight, nine years 2008 ago. 2008 is when we had the, right. the uh, thing, that's when I retired, 2000 after that I yeah. retired. <laughs> you had to I, lay down. I had all the fun I could stand. <laughs> no, oh, but, but uh, that was a wonderful season. That yes. was a great season for me to end my career and and uh, it was fabulous. So Well, I know in one sense uh, you ended your career yeah. with, with what some would say is the largest recording project, single project this town's ever seen. I mean, yeah. recorded right. a thousand titles. In 10 months. In 10 months. Yeah. With five yeah. recording. Uh, anyway. I have a headache. <laughs> you may go lay down again. Yeah. But you're not done because you're still writing songs and you're still uh -huh. part of some things creatively. But I know a big part of your focus these days are those grandchildren. My grandchildren, my three, uh, Georgia Kareen and uh, Magnolia Blythe and, and uh, Tessa Evangeline, uh, those are my, my wife and my greatest ministry right now is to uh, a shepherd mm. to them yes. too. And, and to our, uh, still to our children. You know, my daughter still sits in my lap. And uh, it's, uh, it only gets better. You know, you never imagine when you get married that, uh, <laughs> and you have your kids, you say, how could it possibly, possibly get better? And God just keeps and giving and giving and giving, and you have grandkids and you go, this is unbelievable. <laughs> it got better. It yeah. got better. <laughs> I mean, it gives you goosebumps oh, thinking about it. But I'm doing that and, and uh, also, I. Uh, as you know, working with uh, Jerry and Marla Schrader in uh, yeah. uh, Russia, I go to Russia, and uh, working uh, some in India with uh, 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 Benny Prasad, yes. uh, his Chai 316 project there for, there's a tremendous amount of suicide in Mumbai, and uh, because mm. good isn't good enough uh, over there, and there's, oh. Shame, the whole element of shame and everything in India about not doing uh, well is uh, there's a lot of suicide. So he set up this wonderful uh, project there, and I, I won't go into but it, working with that, and then yeah. a producer in Taipei and uh, Taiwan, and so I'm 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 staying busy. I'm yeah. I'm uh, staying busy doing and writing, but just writing. I don't write because, gee. I, I just need to write today. Uh, I, I want to just keep the, the wheel greased. Yeah. And just well, Greg. Keep not writing. only not only the songs you've written, but the songwriters you've influenced. I, I think about our guys on our team, Paul. Oh, Paul. Paul Marino. Aren't they and Jeremy doing great? Johnson, and these were two guys that you came along in their life and shepherd and loved and, and, and poured so much into. And now yeah. they're they're writing all the music for Vacation Bible School and. 
it's uh, your life way. It's, it's just unbelievable. Yeah. It's, it's so the impact of what you've done. Well, one of those writers that you work closely with is Kirk Kirkland. That's right. And you have a, a obviously you're part of the ministry he's, there at Judson. He, he's yeah. my uh, uh, he's our worship leader at, yeah. at Judson, and his dad, Camp Kirkland, is the orchestra director. And so I'm intersecting with them each week because I'm I'm still playing my cello, and I I still love doing that. And and uh, so we started talking, and he said, well, you know. Uh, let's think about writing something. And it was Christmas. No, I think he came and said, uh, uh, we have to write something on hope. Hmm. And uh, well, hope is something that uh, for me is uh, one of the things uh, that is particularly of interest to me because <clears throat> there's so much going on in our world right now that people don't have hope. Yeah. Uh, they, they look at... Uh, sociologically what's happening, mm -hmm. politically what's going on, and uh, there are people with uh, uh, illnesses, cancer, uh, addiction, mm -hmm. I mean uh, a wayward son or daughter or something like that, and uh, for some people uh, Yeah. They don't have they don't have too much to hang on to. They've gone to church, but but really ha don't understand the depth of Christ's love for us. You know, uh, hope isn't something that is just uh, it is uh, a a uh, wishful thinking. Hope is uh, hope is. Uh, knowing yeah. via the Holy Spirit Absolutely. that God is going to do something. That's the biblical definition of hope. It's not a, we we aspire that something's That's true. Right. Hope is knowing that it's true. Uh, knowing that it's true. Yeah. And in Deuteronomy, it's, uh, it, it talks about, yeah. uh, God said, don't worry about uh, your enemies. He said, know that I'm. Yeah, yeah, N know who he is. I'm Absolutely. with you. Well, I tell you what we're going to do. We're going to listen to this right now. It's a song that you and Kirk wrote together called Hope is Singing. Yes that addresses this very subject. Right. Camp did the arrangement and the orchestration, and we can't wait for you to hear it. Let's listen to it right now.
Greg, thank you for this song, Hope is Singing. And uh, what an important message and a timely word in, the, in a confused world. Well, we tried to, you know, we tried to tell the, uh, the story uh, that, obviously the story of Christmas, but people, you know, they're so numb to the Christmas story that they go, oh yeah, it's a nice time of the year and stuff like that. What they don't understand is in the second verse, hmm. uh, that's what Christ brought hope for. You know, uh, people who've lost their dreams, who've, who, uh, who've kind of lost their way. And, and then the bridge, and it says, it's from uh, 2 Corinthians 4, 6. Hmm. Springing out of darkness, lighting up our, it says hearts, but we had to change it to life. Lighting up our lives. Uh, the uh, seeing the glory uh, reflected in the face of Jesus Christ. Yes, that is the hope of the world. That is the hope of the world yeah. right there. It's not just everything's nice and it's love and let's get presents for everybody. It's uh, it's so much more than that. Yeah, and and uh, it, it's it's a core. And and one of the things too that I just want to say <laughs> this because I've written a. Uh, in fact, Paul Marino and I wrote mm. this, uh, The Face by Which We Stand. Mm -hmm. The most disappointing thing to me about that is when, uh, people really like that chorus, but I've had more than one person say, there's just one line in there that I just I want to stay away from. Mm. We believe God's word is true. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I'm going, yeah, what? Could, why wouldn't you want to say that? Mm. What? Because if it isn't, we don't have any hope. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Well, you don't need to sell this. Oh, yeah, because, man. So, I mean, yeah. so, but uh, there is something in us. Uh, uh, I, I keep coming to that. God saying, hey, don't worry about that. Don't worry about what you see. I'm with you. Yeah. Hey, I can't let you get away without saying this. Um, you, you were part of something recently that I, I was part of behind the scenes. Uh, the, the CCM United. Oh, yeah, uh, that, that was so much fun. Where um, all, as a matter of fact, if you, if you haven't seen CCM United, go to their website and look at this. It was the most amazing night of uh, with 40 years of Christian music right. and all these artists and all this stuff. And, and it was just amazing. And it for you, it would have had to have been like a trip down memory lane it because was. you were such a part of so much of what was happening. But the, probably the part that blessed me the most of that whole night is I think about all those artists and all that music was look up behind up the stage where the artists were singing was this cello player uh, who produced a lot of uh, that music, wrote many of those songs. Yeah. You played in that event, played your cello. Yeah, I did. It was and fun. I, what a beautiful picture of the role that you've had all these years mm -hmm. uh, of producing and writing. And, 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 and I, what a picture that was to me to see yeah. you playing in, in, a, in what would have been thought of maybe in the background and yet right there in the middle of all of that. And, and let me, I was so blessed by let, that night. Well, let me just say this, that, that uh, that's what God does. Yeah. I didn't know what I was doing. You, you know me. I'm yeah. ADHD. Yeah. I, I, I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> and and just God just brought people to yeah. me. I mean, they. It wasn't Sandy and Steve and I, Larnell. I'm from North Dakota. Yeah. I, I graduated from Mary College. I didn't graduate from Manhattan School of Music yeah. or anything like that. And God just said, oh, "Don't worry about that." Yeah, he did it too. Thank you, Greg. And you know what? All those people, you'll never know, you'll never see, but I'm one of those. Well, blessed by I, every bit of that. I'm blessed too. So We love you, man. Thank Great you. Great to see you. Great to see you too. I'm so excited about this next song we're going to look at together. I remember the first time I heard it was when Mike Weaver came to Lifeway. He was visiting here and he brought his guitar and he said, I'd like to play for you guys a song that's about to come out. And of course, Mike Weaver is the lead singer of the group Big Daddy Weave, and the song, Redeemed. He co-wrote this with Benji Cowart, and it is a powerful song of testimony, and this is a great arrangement done by our own Danny Zaludic. Powerful song, great arrangement. Please listen and be blessed by it. Redeemed. Like all I could 
I was so excited recently when Keith Getty could come by Lifeway and spend some time with us. We're going to show you that interview. But Keith and I have a running joke you might want to know about. Of course, Keith is from Ireland. Now, Harland is an Irish name, and Keith tells me his grandfather worked for the Harland and Wolf Steel Company in Ireland, spelled the same way and everything. So he says his grandfather worked for Harlan and now he works for me. Well, that's not technically true. But in this interview, we make an exciting announcement. I can't wait for you to hear it. Let's watch now. Keith, welcome. We're really glad to have you back at Lifeway today. Delighted to be here, Mike. Uh, it's always a pleasure to 
to, to spend time with you. And we've gotten to do a good bit of that recently because we're working on a lot of stuff together. A lot of stuff. Very, very excited about the, but all the things that are happening. All the things that are happening. And uh, really, really excited about how God is raising up you and Kristen's ministry. And it's just been a thrill. It's just a blast to watch you guys to see the Christmas thing last year. I got to be part of the one here in Nashville. It was unbelievable. Probably the best live Christmas concert I've, I've, I've heard in well, a long, very long, kind. long time. Since the previous Christmas. Uh, since the previous, <laughs> actually Christmas. I didn't get to come the previous year. So this year <laughs> I got to come. Um, hey, now you guys are getting ready to go across the pond for a few weeks. So That's we right. grabbed you before you got on the plane. We leave Monday for our family vacation. Yeah, I, it's interesting because a lot of people know you live here in Nashville now and you have right. recent years. Uh, had several children, yeah. and I think you Three know what daughters. I think. Don't we have a pic? We have pictures of your children, so let's bring those up and uh, we'll talk about them. So well, we've got Eliza, so, who's four and a quarter, yeah, and is is redheaded and passionate, and creative. And then we got Charlotte, who is is 19 months and redheaded and passionate <laughs> and creative. And then, <laughs> and then we have a six week old because she and she's black hair. She's called Grace, um, and we were hoping she wouldn't be passionate as passionate because. Of, because of the black hair, but it's not working out. It's not right. working out? No, So you, the, a lot, you've got four girls in your life. I, you know, it's not even 10 o'clock this morning, and I have enjoyed special time with all three of them <laughs> exactly. since 3 o'clock this morning. It's so. wonderful. <laughs> well, Keith, um, what we're going to do today is we're going we're gonna to show these great friends at home the very first release in a new imprint from Lifeway called the Getty Music Series. But it's before fantastic. we get to that... Uh, talk a little bit in general about, now we, we were just referring to your trip that you'll take back home yeah, yeah. to Ireland, but the, your year is kind of in a cycle of, of time. So give us a little idea about how your year rolls out, because I know some of the things, like what's right. facing you right when you get back from right. Ireland. No, that's right. Well, the, from, from, it, it's, almost like, it's almost like students that never grew up. So, so from September until May, June time, typically we're here in Nashville. And then we spend long summers back home in Ireland where we get time with family, with grandparents, parents, all that kind of stuff. And then also I spend time with Stuart and Graham and Kristen writing. So yes. it's, it's, it's really half rest and, and family time and half writing time. And then we, we're here during, the, I guess we call the academic year. Um, we, we, we commit 12 weeks a year towards what you would call road or doing events. And the rest of the time we're, we're writing and, and really trying to be stewards of, of the music that we have. So um, the, the 12 weeks in the road are eight weeks of our hymn tours, which go around the country where we do, that combines concerts and teaching events. And then we also have this, this Christmas tour where we try to take, the, for the most part, we try to take the, Christian, the, the Christmas story to the city center. So it plays, you know, Carnegie Hall and Kennedy Center and all, a lot of yes. the city center events. And it's, it's increasingly become that. So, so it's really just been in, interesting to see how being a steward of the hymns, the first year, of course, we, we, we became friends the first year we lived here. Yes. And at that point, it was, it was we were introducing the hymns with the Lifeway hymnal mm -hmm. and, and doing Lifeway events. It's just been interesting how new opportunities have opened up along the way. And, and really, I, I think for the most part, just good collaborations. People have come along who knew more than we did mm. and, and, and helped find new opportunities for songs that, that, that tell this incredible gospel story to be, to be used. So, yeah, well, it's been exciting for us to uh, to see how God has raised uh, your ministry up and allowed you not only to write the song of faith uh, for the for today's church, but also the church. I think I've heard you say uh, you want to write the kind of songs that they're singing hundreds of years from now. Well, obviously uh, we'll not be there to know, but we try, you, we definitely try yeah. to write. I think for us, it's trying to write songs that that we feel we could we could we could live with the rest of our lives. Songs yeah. we're proud of. So, and um, that's not to say. I mean, that, that's that's just I think our particular niche, and that's what we try to do. So we work. We work really, really hard at writing, and and then I think typically, I think last year we used we used we used three out of about eight hundred tunes. So yeah. we, we we just keep working, keep working, keep recording, right. keep recording, and eventually something something feels special. Exactly. We don't yeah. always get it right, obviously, but you know we, we we keep practicing. Well, what I've been excited too, not only the song of faith that's being developed through the creativity and the collaborations. Of course, you write with Kristen, but also you mentioned yeah. Graham and, and Stuart. Uh, the collaborative efforts uh, yeah. have brought us some wonderful, wonderful things that the church is really being blessed by and yeah. generations are singing together. But you're also speaking to this. You mentioned that you you're, you tour and you sing, but you yeah. teach. And, and uh, uh, the leadership luncheons that you do, would you give give the folks a little idea of that yeah, part well, of your, the, the leadership Yeah, well, the leadership events we do in cities is really about, about talking about um, why we do what we do then introducing new songs and giving material, and then just doing Q&A and having time to chat. I always try to make at least 30% at least of the time just conversation. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, 
we as musicians can't, don't talk to each other enough. We don't encourage each other enough. And when we do this in cities, what usually happens is people who live five minutes from each other or, or minister 15 minutes from each other for the decade have never met. Hmm. And suddenly they're meeting each other mm -hmm. and talking and realizing, that, realizing that actually that they have the same problems yes. and realizing that each one of them can help each other out with a new idea for a song or, 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 a, or a string contractor or whatever that mm -hmm. would be better sure. than the one they have or whatever it is. So the, the collabor I find I find a lot of it is just the fact that we get together and eat together and laugh together and that's I actually think that's the biggest benefit. Obviously it's great for us to introduce our songs to church leaders but in, in terms of the, of the philosophy behind it, the three things we're trying to emphasize to people are number one, um, the importance of, of, of the theology of what we sing. Mm. Um, um, I mean, uh, what we sing affects how we think, how we pray, how we emotionally yes. react yes. Uh, in so many ways. And it's an important, in the 21st century, it is the most exciting century to be a Christian. There are more Christians in the world today than ever before. Christianity is hmm. growing in four and a half continents, but the pressures for us and our children, when I look at my girls this morning, I was actually talking to my wife about it, when I look at what it's going to be like for them to be Christians, they are going to have to be deep believers to flourish yes. in our society. Yes. So this next generation, if we actually want to be futuristic, it's not just a question about trying to copy whatever's happening in the world and mm -hmm. hope that our kids find that uh, uh, like secondary entertainment acceptable. Mm. What we actually have to do is build deep believers. And so one of the ways we do that is through songs. And, um, and then the second thing is, is, is we try to encourage congregational singing. The holy act of congregational singing is exactly that. Yes. When somebody turns up, stands their hand up and says, what should the sound of our congregation's music be? The, the answer every time has to be the sound of your people singing. Yes, Do you know absolutely. what I mean? That is the sound it should it's, be. That's it. And, that's the privilege, it. and the privilege that we, we musicians have to add color and beauty and inspiration and encouragement to that through our music is it's a privilege. It's, it's actually an unnecessary privilege. They don't mm. need us, mm. but we're there to do that. And yes. so we try and encourage churches every Sunday and every Monday when they review church services to say, how are our congregations singing? Uh, and make that the, f the first question we ask, and then building our music around that. And um, and then the third thing is just to encourage, and, and, th and that means whether you're a choir, whether you're a worship leader, whether you're a, a senior pastor, um, whatever you are in your church, is always building this culture of how is our congregation singing. And then the third thing is to try and encourage people to have songs that they take with them through life. Yeah. We, uh, we, we've talked about this. I remember the very first yes. year we talked about this. Uh, you know, what, what are the songs you will carry with us when we grow old? You ask, you ask 100 people over the age of 70, what are the songs that have affected them most deeply in their life? And 90%, not all of it, not all of it, but 90% of it will be the songs they carried with them through life. So yeah. the question for our generation is, what are the songs we're carrying with us through life? Most yeah. of the, most churches I know are carrying six songs with them through life, and that's not enough. Oh, man. So we need well, more. I, I've got to ask you about this because it's such a unique thing. Yeah. But you and Kristen were part of the CBS Sunday Morning. Oh, thing. yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, and, and. Yeah, they came to our other house and they stayed there for a couple of days and videoed everything we were doing and they followed us to the Grand Ole Opry. It could have been a reality show. Oh, yeah. It would have been awesome. <laughs> it, kind of, it kind of was. So. <laughs> but now, now, you did you did us a little bit of a favor in all of that. Well, I, I used it wasn't a this mug. No, I used the old Lifeway Songs cup. He had the Lifeway Songs cup in the CBS. Any chance Sunday I get? Morning any show. chance I get? So, go to Lifeway for your church music. Exactly. Everyone. Go so, to Lifeway. So we're grateful for that. Well, right. today, thank you for that. Was, was it 14 million viewers watched the Lifeway uh, Songs? Something like some, that. Some and I mean, numbers. we've seen absolutely no result from that. What's but I mean, well, <laughs> when you do, when you do, you know. You can you can you can give us a nod, you know. Well, Keith, something else we've been talking about for several years is Lifeway and Getty Music doing something together. Now the church is going to find the great songs that God is yeah. allowing you to steward, uh, and we're very very excited when we see that happen. When any other company does it, and all of them are using many of your songs, so we're grateful for that. But we also are very very happy that we're going to be stewarding an imprint Getty Music Series that's going to come out this fall, the very first release from it. Yeah, yeah. And we're, we're very excited that uh, David Hamilton is going to be the arranger and orchestrator right. of that. We've already been in the studio. We're going to show you the first release that's coming from the Getty Music Series in just a moment. But give us your impressions of what your excitement well, about Well, it's beautiful. I've always, I mean, obviously, th this was a culmination. We've, we've, first year we were here, we worked on the hymnal. Um, the second year we did some chapels and we got to work with various departments in Lifeway. I think we, we've never had a year where we weren't doing something in Lifeway. So this really, to me, is a culmination of, of yeah. the relationship in many ways. And um, 
obviously we, I, I love David's artistry. He and I, it's really funny because he and I, in my 20s, before I became permanent, you know, before, before I became a full-time hymn writer, in my 20s I was an orchestrator and he and I, you know, co-orchestrated projects together. Michael mm. W. Smith's Healing Rain was, yeah. was the two of us orchestrating all the different tracks wow. around each other. So the two of us have enjoyed friendship and enjoyed making music together for years. And we both felt, we both felt it would be great to do a project like this with Lifeway, but we also felt it was time, it was time to create something that also <coughs> just, just pushed the envelope a little bit with creativity. Um, that, that, that didn't just sound like a choral project, but took the best of, of, of beautiful historical music, of, of classical music, of movie scores, uh, and, just, and just opened people's imaginations to something yeah. that, was, that was a little bit special. And so I think with that, he, he really did some beautiful work. Mm. The, the, the overture, maybe the best overture I've ever heard for yes. a choral project. Uh, um, and then of course, this is something that we've tried and tested. The, the hymn tour for us, this moment of Gethsemane, moving to the power of the cross, and releasing with when I survey, and then the option of going into the resurrection with Christ as risen, as risen indeed, is, is to most people in our concert, probably 60% of our concert will say that is the most powerful moment of oh, the concert. Powerful. So yeah. we've been able to create that in a microcosm and now give it that other churches can do it. So Well, it's beautiful, and, and if you're familiar with David Hamilton's work, you know that he's a brilliant musician, and this is David Hamilton at his best with wonderful songs. Uh, Kristen does a reading in the recording and the prologue, the overture. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, if you'll do this in your church, she will come to your church and read this. <laughs> <laughs> Please don't tell her I said that. Um, it's should. called The Power of the Cross, and it is a suite uh, for Good Friday, but it goes all the way to the resurrection. Now, what we're going to do right now is we're going to play for you excerpts of the first several selections from this. Then we'll come back and share the, the way it ends in a little bit. So let's enjoy The Power of the Cross, A Sweet for Good Friday, the very first release from the Getty Music Series, David Hamilton, Arranger and Orchestra. Let's listen now. Of dry ground. He had no form or majesty that we should look at him, and no beauty that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, and as one from whom men hide their faces, he was despised, and we esteemed him not. was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds, we are healed.
Keith, we are so excited about that. I mean, just the snippets we've listened to just now. I, I cannot wait good, for everybody to hear the whole thing. We're going to, no, we were talking while that was going on about Good Friday wouldn't be the only time you could do this, right? No, the first time we actually did it in a Baptist church in, in Texas, they wanted it as a flow out of communion. Yeah. And of course, it's we, we've used it for our, when we did the, the, the hymn tour in the symphony halls in the UK, um, Alistair Begg came with us, it was the evangelistic moment in the second half. So it, it fits a number of other contexts. In fact, it's just a gospel, so it fits. So, But it, it is definitely an Easter suite that fits very comfortably um, at, at multiple times. So the choir, once the choir have learned it, they can reuse it. And actually the choir can be bound either to the, the, the broader worship life of the church and congregational singing of the church, or the choir can be used in the, the, the missions role of the congregation as well. So it, it helps the choir, you know, be really integrated into church life. Well, there's one more one more part of this that can be used later. If you did this on Good Friday and you didn't want to 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 announce the resurrection yet, you could mm -hmm. you could there's a stopping place. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then you could come back that next Sunday with the last selection of this and we're going to listen to it in its entirety right now. The great song, the resurrection hymn that you guys wrote, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. So let's let's enjoy that together right now.
Great, Keith. Awesome. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you for this. We're excited about this first release, excited about the next few things that will be coming out in the, in the months ahead, and then what we're already planning to record next. Can't no, we? it's going to be great. All kinds of things Thanks. for every season. Thanks for coming today. Thanks. We're really appreciative of you spending this time with us today. It's always a joy to share the new music, to share the interviews, to be in the chat with you. Thank you for all the ways you connect with us. We want to serve you the best way we can. The last song we're going to look at is from a project called Jesus, Hope of the World from our friend Mark Willard and Sherwood Baptist Church. He co-wrote this song with Mark Harris. It's called More Than I Can Imagine. We love it. I think you'll love it too. no condemnation there is no more fear sin and death are defeated now that you are here my spirit is alive and I will testify my spirit Bye.